Good afternoon, distinguished friends. Uh, I'm sorry, I have to begin with some unpleasant news. Uh, Dr. Fasgraf won't be uh, able to join us today because of uh, the flu and uh, laryngitis, but he sends his regards, which I'm glad to convey to you uh, at all. In any event, it's a pleasure to be here with such a distinguished group of scholars and current and former public officials. I'll keep my remarks brief so that all of our panelists have plenty of time to share their thoughts and take questions. When considering the state of democracy in Latin America, it is always good to maintain some perspective. Not so long ago, Mexico was ruled by a one-party autocracy. Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, and other countries were ruled by military dictatorships. El Salvador, Guatemala, and Nicaragua were engulfed in civil wars. And only a handful of nations were truly democratic. In other words, compared with the early 1980s, Latin American democracy is doing pretty well. And yet, over the past 15 years, Latin America has become a region divided. Divided between authoritarian populism and liberal democracy. Divided between 21st century socialism and free market capitalism. Unlike in the old days when the biggest threat to democracy came from armed guerrillas and military coups, the biggest threat today comes from elected autocrats, that is, leaders who were fairly elected but have proceeded to hollow out democratic institutions, persecute political opponents, and attack independent journalists. Meanwhile, in Mexico and the Northern Triangle countries of Central America, there is a different threat to democracy stemming from brutal drug cartels and transnational street gangs. I'm sure our panelists will have plenty to say about those challenges as well. The trend of elected autocracy began with Hugo Chavez the late Venezuelan president who took office in 1999 and died of cancer in 2013. After briefly losing power during an abortive coup in 2002, Chavez moved to cement his socialist revolution. By 2005, he had packed the Supreme Court and turned the National Assembly into a virtual rubber stamp. With the help of these institutions, along with the National Electoral Council, the Armed Forces, the Federal Police, and, Pro and Pro Chavez military paramilitary groups, he waged a relentless campaign to destroy critical media outlets, terrorize opposition politicians, and tighten his grip on the, on the Venezuelan economy. Thus, while the Chavez regime was installed democratically, it governed as a lawless dictatorship for the last several years of Chavez's life. Chavez has been dead for more than a year now, but the spirit of his revolution lives on in Venezuela, where Nicolás Maduro has violently suppressed PIP, public demonstrations, and jailed his democratic opponents. The presence of Cuban operatives has become overwhelming in that country. Again, it's important to remember that all those leaders, Ortega, Morales, Correa, and Kirchner, were democratically elected and then re-elected. But they have all tried to rig the system obliterate opposition media, establish near dictatorial control over public institutions, and in such an environment, you can never have a truly free and fair election. 
The United States obviously has a major interest in preserving Latin American democracy, yet it has shown relatively little leverage over the uh, government in Caracas, eh, Managua, La Paz, Quito, and Buenos Aires. However, the Organization of American States can and should play a key role in defending and encouraging democracy throughout the region. I'm sure this point will be uh, amply discussed by, di by Dr. Kevin Casasamora in his uh, keynote presentations. And with that, I see the podium to my good friend and compatriot, Dr. Casas Zamora. Well, thank you very much to you all for, for being here. And I would like to start by saying what a, what a joy and what an honor it is to, for me to be here at the Hudson for, for the first time. And I owe that joy and that honor to Ambassador Darenblum, uh, who's not only a good friend, but a, a true uh, I would venture a national treasure of my country and someone that represents the best of Costa Rica very well wherever he goes. I'm glad you said that be before my boss here. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. It really is. And I would like to, uh, I would like to express my, my, my joy also for uh, sharing this, this panel with such distinguished speakers as uh, René and, and Hector. Um, we're here to talk about the prospects for democracy in, in Latin America. And in, in hearing Ambassador Darenblum, um, you know, let me, let me say right off the bat that it's fairly clear that we have uh, cases in which the state of democracy, at least if we embrace a liberal democratic conception, is riddled with problems and indeed threats in Latin America. And it is also clear that with regards to those threats to democracy, we are encountering, and here I guess I speak out of direct experience being at the OAS, we are encountering very serious problems in the instruments conceived to collectively protect democracy in the hemisphere. And these uh, problems are, um, are multifold. Uh, on the one hand, the, if, you, if you take a close look at the Inter-American Democratic Charter, it is, a, it is a terrific document, but it's a document that nonetheless was conceived in terms of its intention to protect democracy, was conceived in terms of more traditional threats to democracy. In terms of the you know, outright fraud, you know, the guy that goes and stuff the ballot boxes before the election, which is something that doesn't really happen anymore. I mean, that's for the clumsy guys, you know. Uh, or, or in terms of, uh, uh, of, you know, the conventional coup d'etat, which is something that doesn't really happen uh, mercifully, doesn't really happen uh, anymore in the, in the region. Uh, the, the more visible problems nowadays, the more visible threats, such as uh, situations in which you have cl clashes between branches of the state, that's not really covered by the Inter-American Democratic Charter. So, I mean, we have a problem in the instruments that we have at hand to collectively protect democracy. But we also have a much, you know, a much deeper issue, which is not exclusive to, to say, the OAS. It's a, it's a more general issue, which is 
the paradox that uh, right at the moment when we all became uh, uh, democratic nations, those mechanisms to protect democracy were rendered ineffective because they have to be applied to governments that can legitimately claim to be the products of the ballot box. And believe me, they wave that fig leaf in a very effective way, and they throw it back at you. So there seems to be a paradox there in the sense that right when we were ready to celebrate the triumph of democracy, the mechanisms to collectively protect democracy were rendered uh, uh, much less effective. So anyway, there are very clear challenges to democracy in a few countries in Latin America at this time, just as there are very clear limits to the instruments devised to protect democratic institutions in the region. And I'm sure we're going, we're going to touch upon uh, both aspects uh, abundantly in this discussion. However, what I'm going to try and do in the next 15 minutes or so is something slightly different. I would like to take a step back and take a longer and broader view of the prospects for democracy in the region. And I would like to talk about some tectonic changes, if you will, that will define the future of democracy in Latin America. Hence, I would like to focus less on this specific juncture and more on the long-term forces that are likely to shape democracy in Latin America in the more distant future. And to that effect, I would like to put on the table five phenomena that are taking place in the region as we speak and which are laden with consequences for democracy. The first one is, and this might sound slightly paradoxical, given the way this discussion was uh, shaped. The first phenomena, phenomenon is the emergence of a deep trend towards ideological convergence. This may sound paradoxical, but beyond the headlines, beyond the headlines uh, which talk about an ideological rift in Latin America, the truth is that when you take a close look at regional surveys, when we, when we scratch a little bit beneath the surface, what we find is that public opinion has converged in a remarkable way towards the center of the spectrum. And that a region-wide consensus on what good governance is seems to have emerged. And it does not matter very much whether candidates hail from the left or the right. And don't take my word for it. If you take the figures from, uh, uh, from the latest edition of Latino Barometro, uh, which came out in 2013, there's about 40%, 38, if I recall correctly, 38% of the population in Latin America that defines itself as being in the center of the spectrum. If you add about 20% that are reluctant to place themselves in the left to right uh, scale, you have about 55 to 60% of the population that are neither on the left nor on the right. So if you want to get elected in Latin America, with very few exceptions, if you want to get elected in Latin America, you have to cater to the center of the spectrum. Otherwise, you're doomed. And I get the sense that you know, there's a sort of consensus that has emerged in the region that contends that good governance is first, about being elected in free and fair elections. Second, it is about paying close attention to macroeconomic equilibrium and being aware that playing fast and loose with those macroeconomic equilibria is a very bad idea. And third, 
It is about implementing aggressive social policies able to make a dent on both poverty and inequality. If you stop for a second and, and think of it, the admission of those three things amounts to a massive intellectual and political shift in Latin America. I mean, those things were never, uh, were never accepted uncritically in Latin America. Now, they largely are. Latin American societies are slaying fairly big dragons that have arrested their development for a very long time. And my impression is that those intellectual changes are here to stay. So that's the first point. The second phenomenon that I would like to, to, to mention is that political representation is changing fast in the region and the traditional instruments of representation are in deep trouble. If parties ever had the monopoly over political representation in Latin America, it is abundantly clear that they own it no more. Take any regional survey and you, and you will see the, how acute the discredit of political parties is throughout the region. And it's not just that, it's the combination of that with increasingly active, vibrant, vocal civil societies throughout the region. Civil society is much more active, but also much more fragmented. And it's also the fact that mass media have acquired in some senses have taken over traditional functions of political representation. And let me, let me ask you a question. If you're, I don't know, some kind of grassroots leader and you have uh, some kind of grievance in your community in Latin America, where do you take that grievance nowadays? Do you take it to the local branch of the political party or do you take it to the TV station? Obviously, you go to the TV broadcaster. So mass media have really eaten up into the traditional function of mediation and representation that parties used to have, at least in other places. I'm not sure in Latin America. And to all that, you have to add the role of social networks, which are deeply changing the nature of political representation in the region in a way that uh, have really thrown political parties off balance. Political parties, uh, in a very visible way, have not been able to ride the wave of social networks successfully in Latin America. And that leads me to a, what I think is a, very, is a very fundamental question that we have to ask ourselves, not just in Latin America, which is, uh, you know, looking at the political landscape in Latin America, you really have to ask uh, yourself whether political parties uh, were a phenomenon of the 20th century. You know, there is nothing written in the stars, in the stars about political parties or political institutions in, in, in general. You know, when we, when we look at, I don't know, economic history, there are many institutions that were essential uh, in capitalism that have been thrown into oblivion. I mean, our, our uh, capitalist economies are very different from the way they were in the 18th century. So it might well be the case that some political institutions are destined to disappear and political parties might be among them. I mean, no one I know, particularly no one of a certain age, wants to belong to a political party. I don't know if anybody here knows anyone, any young person in Latin America that wants to become engaged in a political party. 
I mean, whenever you ask them that question, they, they stare back at you and, you know, as though you were a Martian. So uh, political representation has really overwhelmed political parties, has, has gone beyond political parties, and they are not proving able to adapt. The question is, will they? And it, it, this is something that I think we need to think about uh, uh, in a much deeper way. And, and this has practical implications. And I'll give you one example. I mean, something that concerns me a little bit about the, the Pact for Mexico, which is generally regarded as a very successful experience. When you, when you I mean, not so long ago, I had the chance to, to have a conversation with some of the people that, you know, from the three main political parties in Mexico that crafted the Pact for Mexico. And you get the sense that they are utterly convinced that they have enough legitimacy to be able to carry behind them the Mexican society in a road to reform uh, which in some aspects is very radical. And, I mean, all the power to them. I mean, I, I, I like the stuff that is in the Pact for Mexico, but I'm not sure whether they have the level of legitimacy that they, they seem to believe they have. So there, there might be forces of contestation uh, uh, with regards to those reforms that might become active and my claim that those who are making those, those reforms do not represent all sectors in society. So this, you know, this notion that political representation is changing, uh, I think deserves uh, more attention than it usually gets. Number three, the third phenomenon that I think uh, that, that, that I would like to mention is the revamping of constitutional frameworks in the region. In quite a few cases, the constitutional settlements negotiated during the transitions are showing their age and their limits. And if you take a close look at some of the, of the latest political crises that we've had in the region in places like Honduras and Paraguay, uh, the constitutional framework was a major character in the, in the, in the plot. Uh, I mean, I could give several examples, particularly the case of Honduras, of how the constitution became a huge, huge problem in terms of finding an adequate uh, um, solution to the political crisis and how it became part of the problem. So, it, to me, it is... Uh, interesting to notice that throughout the region there's a visible proliferation of political reforms. You see that in Mexico, you see that in Brazil, you see that in Chile. Uh, now Panama, after the election, is is announcing that they the new the president elect is is considering uh, pushing for a constitutional assembly. Uh, Colombia will have very significant political changes uh, if they manage to close the, the peace negotiation. Uh, political, very significant political reforms will ensue. So it, there seems to be a regional trend at play here. And, and I'm convinced that this will be one of the big political stories in the region over the next 10 years or so. The speed with which these reforms are introduced is a thorny issue and one that deserves attention. Brazil, you know, when, when they had all these millions of people uh, going out on the street and demonstrating, uh, and, and as a result of that, a political reform effort was, uh, uh, was called upon. It, it, my impression is that Brazil is a case that shows the effects of delaying an inevitable political reform, given that some of the political institutions that they have are at the root of the corruption problems that people so uh, um, angrily are complaining against. But also, the opposite is, is, is a problem as well. I mean, when you take the case of Mexico, you cannot 
help but to think that the haste in introducing political reforms and pushing them down the throat of society without carefully thinking through the consequences can also be a huge problem. I mean, this is a field that is laden with unintended consequences. So, uh, you know, it is a problem when you delay an inevitable political reform, but it's also a problem when you adopt it in a, in a, in a, in a you know, amidst haste and as part of a, of a very, you know, of short term, as a result of short term considerations. Number four, the hollowing out of the rule of law. And Ambassador Dadenblum uh, mentioned that in passing. Uh, fear of crime, even more so than actual crime, is extremely high and growing in Latin America. And what is quite remarkable is that uh, when you look at, once again, regional surveys, and I, I wrote, you know, my previous incarnation, when I was at the, at the Brookings, I wrote something uh, about this. Uh, nearly 40% of the population in Latin America and the Caribbean are willing to tolerate the abuse of authority in the name in the name of the fight against crime. And what is even more remarkable, over one fourth of the population in the region has a favorable opinion of the notion of taking the law into our own hands. That is, in 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 other words about 150 million people that do not peacefully accept the state's monopoly over legitimate coercion. That is the most basic principle that undergirds uh, political order in a modern society. And when you travel in the region, and particularly when, when you uh, you know, when you, when you deal with election campaigns and so on, which is my case, the, the discourse of the iron fist, the la mano dura, is never far below the surface. Uh, um, it was, just to give you an example, it was uh, the biggest, the single biggest issue in the last election in Honduras. I mean, for rather obvious reasons, but what was really noteworthy was how how vocal was the invocation of the, the Manu Luda approach, particularly by, by the candidate that ended up uh, winning the election. And we also saw you know, bits of that in, in Panama as well. And, and one of the, you know, when, when you look at the evidence in Latin America when it comes to, to, to fear of crime, one of the striking things and, and this is mildly depressing, but is uh, em, 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 empirically sustained, is that when it comes to crime and to fear of crime, people adapt. People adapt their behavior and simply accept a greater encroachment in their civil liberties <laughs> and embrace an ever more cavalier added it towards the rule of law. And what, uh, what we are risking here is not that for the sake of fighting crime, people are going to over or are going to consent to their democratic governments being overthrown, but that cardinal principles uh, of the rule of law will be hollowed out. And as a result, democracy will be impoverished. Number five, there's a very intense proliferation of social demands. As some of you know, I mean, just last year it was claimed that for the first time, the middle class is larger in Latin America than lower income groups. This is a first. It's not just that the middle class is larger than ever, but for the first time is larger than lower income groups. And this is, once again, uh, full of consequences for democracy. 
uh, just to name one, the middle classes in Latin America and everywhere provide the voice that demands the quality in public goods and public services. And when you, when you ask people in the region these days about their expectations, uh, you cannot help but to see the extraordinarily high expectations about the future that have grown uh, as a result of a very successful decade uh, uh, economic-wise for, for Latin America. So uh, once again, if you take Latino Arometro uh, 2013, 51% of the population in the region believe that their economic, the economic situation of their family will improve in the, in the course of the next year. And that figure is, is 65% for Brazil, 63% uh, in Colombia. So the, the level of expectations that uh, are part of the political landscape is, is really quite remarkable. And the problem is that there are very serious problems in the fiscal capacity of the state in Latin America to fulfill the growing demand for better public goods and services. As we know well, tax burdens in most countries, there are a few exceptions, tax burdens are very low and very slow to change. But there's also, and this is a point that I want to stress, there's also the problem of the quality of public management in Latin America. And here, the experience of Brazil is rather ominous. Brazil is a case in which there's, high, there's a high tax burden I mean, tax collection in Brazil is about 36, 37% of GDP, which is roughly the average of OECD countries. So you have high tax burden and poor quality of public services. No wonder people are on the street. So the Brazilian case offers a, a very important warning, a cautionary tale. If people like me, I mean, I do believe that tax reform is truly the key, uh, let's say one of the key pending assignments in Latin America. So if people like me are going to insist and to push for more taxes in the region, we better be sure that they will lead to better services because that consequence is by no means inevitable and we might end up in the worst of all worlds. So there's a great risk, I think, of democracies in the region being overloaded with social demands. And that calls for many things, but one in particular uh, I think is important. We have to adopt a more sober view of what democracy and public policies can achieve. We have to curb expectations. And obviously, no politician wants to do this because they tend to have this messianic self-perception. I used to be a politician, too. <laughs> they have this messianic self-perception. So a more sober attitude is, is called for. And, and, you know, it's called for and it's, it's probably accurate, too, to be entirely candid with you. I mean, the fact of the matter is that when you when you think about it, profound social transformations are only rarely the result of political decisions, but of other more fundamental forces such as technological or demographic change. So no matter what politicians do or do not do in Latin America, Latin American societies in 20 years time, we'll have more women in the labor force. No matter what politicians in Latin America do or do not, Latin American societies will be older than they are now. No matter what politicians do in Latin America, Latin American societies will have more access to information and communication technologies. No matter what politicians do, Latin American societies will be more secular, and so on and so forth. So the truly profound social transformations are not really up to politicians. They can channel 
in adequate ways that can affect those transformations on the margins, but they won't be able, I mean, it's not politicians who are going to change societies in, in Latin America, to tell you the truth. So these are, I venture, five traits that will likely shape democracy in Latin America in the near and not so near future. It will be a more consolidated democracy in many ways, but a more besieged one in some other ways. In the next couple of decades, democracy in Latin America, democracy in Latin America will in many ways lead a dangerous life which is, I'm afraid, the fate of political regimes in society undergoing rapid social and economic transformations. And that is Latin America. Thank you. I'm very, thank you very much, uh, Kevin. It's, uh, it's my, my pleasure and great satisfaction to uh, see the podium to my good friend, old colleague, Don René León, former ambassador of, uh, from El Salvador here in our country, in, uh, the, United, in the United States. Thank you, Jaime. I just want to thank the Houston uh, Institute for this invitation, especially Ambassador Jaime Darenblum, for bringing me out of uh, retirement, actually, after five years of uh, being an outsider for this kind of events in Washington, D.C. And, uh, you know, I feel like an old soccer uh, trainer who comes back to a match after five years of not having any contact with soccer. So let us see how I will do it. <laughs> I would like also to thank Hector and, and Kevin for, for, for uh, being here with me today. And uh, I think that Kevin's uh, presentation has set up the stage for uh, a very, uh, I would say, profound discussion about the challenge of Latin America uh, democracy and also about uh, where uh, the hemisphere, this part of the hemisphere, is heading in the next 25 years. As part of my, my new responsibilities, and given the fact that once you're an ambassador, you never cease to be an ambassador, the, the um, company that I work for had a, a little issue with the US Congress. And um, here I come. I was called to go to the US Congress and remember all friends and contacts in the US Congress who were dealing with this uh, topic. And then I ran into the, uh, in the halls of the, of, of the US Senate, I ran into a former friend of us, very dear friend of us, who just saw me and asked me this question. I thought we dealt with the transition to democracy and the issue of authoritarian regimes, regimes in Latin America 25 years ago. <laughs> And how come Ortega is still around governing Nicaragua? Where come Chavez, Maduro, Morales, Ortega, Kirchner, Correa, it all came about? Could you explain me what happened with democracy in Latin America in the last 25 years? And I said, oh my gosh. I mean, <laughs> that's a question for an entire conference, a symposium, basically. And uh, he put me to the corner and try to think of, you know, explaining what had happened in Latin America in the past 25 years. And going back to my uh, metaphor about the soccer trainer, you know, I just came up with this soccer trainer from South America explanations. What can I say, Senator? Transition to democracy is long and complicated. The path to democracy is not the same in country with different backgrounds, culture, history, and economic conditions. And we should focus not only about democracy, but about the quality of democracy. You know, I was not really satisfied <laughs> with my uh, 
soccer training questions about such a difficult uh, question that was posed to me, but I think it was a little bit unfair <laughs> for me to answer what has happened in the region in the last 25 years when we were supposed to be in a path to democracy and not necessarily all the countries have ended up in the path to democracy we foresaw 25 years ago. This is a special day for Latin America. We're here discussing the prospects and the future of uh, democracy in the region. At the same time that the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee is discussing how to impose sanctions to Venezuela political operators and how to deal with the uh, Venezuelan regime and the problems that the Venezuelan regimes uh, are experiencing now and how they affect the relationship not only between the United States and Venezuela, but between the United States and Latin America. In the meantime, Diosdado Cabello, the president of the National Assembly, lost his visa yesterday. And who was upset today in Venezuelan television? So we're discussing about Latin America. The US Congress is discussing about Latin America, whether uh, the Department of State has or doesn't have a Latin American policy to deal with these issues. I think that the mere fact that there is a, that there is a commission or the, or the Foreign Relations Committee is looking at this problem, speak of the fact that something is missing in US foreign policy with respect to Latin America. And yet, uh, we keep moving and still hope to advance forward in the path to democracy. Three newly democratically elected presidents are about to be inaugurated. Today, Luis Guillermo Solis in Costa Rica, as we speak, is being inaugurated as the new president of Costa Rica. Salvador Sanchez Sereni in my own country of El Salvador will be inaugurated on June 1st of this year. Juan Carlos Varela in Panama was elected last Sunday, surprisingly, for some people, uh, the new uh, constitutional president of Panama. President Hernandez from Honduras started his new government in January of this year. And Colombia presidential elections are around the corner. So in some ways, it's business as usual in Latin America. Doing a little bit more of uh, deep thinking about my old senator's friend, a question, because yes, we dealt with that 25 years ago, and 25 years ago, Otto de Tango said that 20 years is nothing. 25 years ago was a long time ago. <laughs> 25 years ago, I start thinking about and revising what has happened in Latin America in those 25 years. And what has happened in Latin America has been the proliferation of regimes that combine democratic institutions with element of authoritarianism. Leaders, as a matter of fact, are elected under the formality of free and fair elections. But more and more and more in some countries, like Venezuela, like Ecuador, like Nicaragua, and I can add my own country, like El Salvador, mm. under a not so level playing field that lend itself to outsiders and not so outsiders coming into power to dissolve and control Congress or national assemblies to their own power benefit, to grab dictatorial powers to rule by decree, to violate individual liberties, human and democratic rights in, conduct, in conjunction sometimes with the judicial authorities, to persecute repressed journalists and shut down critical media outlets, to intimidate, incarcerate, and prosecute political opposition leaders and students like happened that just this very day in Venezuela, 292 students were put in jail for protesting against the Maduro regime. 
commit abuses of state power to win yet more elections, use social programs to buy votes, use the power of the state to win elections, and not in a disguised way, in a very clear and systematic way, to eliminate the check and balances in the political system, to promote constitutional changes for indefinite re-elections to personal benefits or political benefits. And it is not that this phenomenon is new in Latin America. It's the proliferation of regimes doing that in Latin America, which I think is relevant. Of course, it was done by Fujimori in Peru in early 90s. Of course, it was done by the PRI in Mexico for more than 75 years. Of course, it was done by um, <clears throat> Serrano Elias in Guatemala. And of course, it has been done in the past, if we go back in time even to Peron's time. So this is nothing new in Latin America. I think that what it is new is the fact that it's growing, it's killing democracy, and now even we have a very fancy name for it, competitive dictatorships. <laughs> competitive dicta dictatorships where democratic institutions live hand to hand with dictatorial practices, which is what is happening in many countries in Latin America right now. It will have take me a lot of time to explain my senator friend that competitive dictatorship is what is, has happened in Latin America in the last 25 years. The development of this problem is actually the biggest threat to democracy in Latin America right now. And Venezuela here is not only, I would say, the most representative case of a competitive dictatorship, but I would say is a special case. And it's a special because it's, it is combining competitive dictatorship with 21st century socialism. In other words, it's not only becoming increasingly a dictatorship state, but at the same time, is ruining, ruining its own economy. At the same time, Venezuela is right now the economy with one of the highest external debts in Latin America with the highest rate of devaluation in Latin America, with huge fiscal deficits, unlike Brazil, with uh, rising unemployment and eroding income of the population. And like cancer, it doesn't make any distinction whether you're rich, poor, or middle class. With huge criminality and insecurity, it's not only that you feel threatened, it's that you are experiencing violence. It's not only that the state cannot only protect you, it's that you feel hopeless with respect of one of the basic <laughs> deliverables for a democratic society, which in this case will be uh, the deliverable of uh, security. It has a huge recession and just graduated a couple of days ago by giving all Venezuelans who are willing to make a line a rationing card, like in Cuba. So rationing card, I think, is the graduation that each Venezuela is receiving from the socialism of the 21st century granted courtesy of a dictator, competitive dictator government with a very wrong economic model. So that would be fine 
in terms of uh, options, one of the options will be to wait for the Venezuelan economy to implode, which is very close. And we will hear, by the way, the sound of that explosion even here in Washington. But it's not the case. I mean, we have witnesses in every other instance in the past that waiting for the implosion of a regime or an economic system is not enough. Venezuela has another point that differentiates itself in seeking for a competitive dictatorship in, in Latin America. And this is that it has made serious attempts to export the Bolivarian, Bolivar, Bolivarian Revolution using oil money to other countries in the region. It failed in Honduras, barely, last November. It won in El Salvador last April. If there is a country who is the next in line to become the next competitive dictatorship in the Western Hemisphere, sadly enough, for me and my compatriots, will be El Salvador. Why? Several reasons. Alba Petróleo's influence in the elections in El Salvador was blunty. What is Alba Petróleo's? Is Petro Caribe Plus. It's a society created by municipalities of the FMLN with Venezuelan oil money to import oil from Venezuela and make huge profits out of which the liabilities of importing this oil will be paid to the Venezuelan people in 25 years at no interest. That has turned out to convert, to transform the political class in El Salvador into the new entrepreneurial class. They are the ones who have liquidity. They are the new investors in El Salvador. And they are the ones now with profits closing right now to half a billion dollars financing political campaigns for the FMLN. So interestingly enough, not only there, not only a engendro, how would I could say that? It, not only this invention by the Venezuela regime and El Salvador left has created this money-making machine whose profits are being invested into local politics, but they're also violating electoral rules. You know, it was funny. If you saw all the um, press conferences in El Salvador during the two rounds of election, you will, you will see through your TV screens in all forests like this, political forests, that the uh, main sponsor of TV station was Alba Petróleo's water bottles. So you will see Alba Petróleo's water, water waters with the flag of the FMLN in every single talk show program. Inviting people to vote for the FMLN. You know, those are the niceties of, uh, of uh, political marketing when you are under a competitive dictatorship. Elect President Sanchez Seren, who by the way, was kissing the ring of Castro last week, and also was kissing the ring of Maduro, and said that Maduro is his inspiration, his president, and that he will follow his guidance because he's the beacon for the Americas, is talking a very, I would say, moderate <laughs> reconciliation discourse in El Salvador, inviting the private sector to invest in his government, inviting his political opposition to come and negotiate and establish a political dialogue 
in El Salvador, while at the same time, he's doing exactly the opposite in Cuba and Venezuela. So, basically, this is bad news for El Salvador, and I think it's bad news for Central America in general. Already the FMLN regime, during these five years, during the President Funes administration has attempted to dismantle the Supreme Court, has talked and promote change of the Constitution to introduce plebiscites and referendums to perpetuate in power. And they were, fortunately enough, stopped by the new political actors that Kevin was signaling, which are basically civil society organizations. Not even the po opposition political parties were able to derail those attempts. It had to come from civil society. Good news is that the FMLN and Sanchez Seren won't do anything strategically in the next year to build an open competitive dictatorship in El Salvador only because election for mayors and election for Congress are due in March 2015. So tactically, it's not in, the very, in their best interest to start pursuing that um, objective in the next year. It will be postponed. Wait until a year from now. Well until the first year of the new elected government in El Salvador is finished. Dante Caputo, like 20 years ago, I think that defined the challenge to democracy in a very, I would say, in one phrase. I love one phrases because one phrases uh, speak more than a lot of discourses. He said, the main challenge to democracy is to stop the slow death of democracy in the Western Hemisphere, in Latin America specifically. And the slow death of democracy is occurring through these competitive dictatorships or hybrid regimes or whatever you want to call it, of which combines the benefits of democracy with the worst of dictatorship. So apparently, if there is a main challenge for democracy in Latin America is to slow the death of democracy and to stop the consolidation of full-fledged dictatorships, to return exactly to the point we were when my dear senator, good friend of him and me, encountered Latin America 25 years ago. Freedom House, again, who has been uh, quoted here, said that in Latin America, the partially free country's percentage is increasing, and it will increase. I always <laughs> have troubles understanding what a partially free country means under the Latino barometer because it's like a half-pregnant woman. So 28% of the democracies in Latin America are half-pregnant. We don't know if they're going to deliver a democracy or are they going to deliver a dictatorship. So that's an important challenge. The other challenge, I think, are equally daunting. It will require a lot of work to do and are challenges on itself. On the internal front, carry out political reforms. Paradoxically enough, in order to democratize political parties in Latin America, which are not, they're the representatives of democracy, but they're not democratic parties. Avoid organized crime and narco-trafficking financing political parties, which occurs not only in my country, in several countries in Latin America. Control 
political corruption, control or avoid connection with the facto powers. Now, from the facto powers who formed these non-saint alliances with political parties, now we're having external governments and entities doing political connections with ruling parties in Latin America. Interestingly, interestingly enough, political parties and democratic institutions have, are weak right now and distrusted by the people. If I would ask you who is the most distrusted and discredited democratic political institution in El Salvador, by a sounding 80% is the National Assembly in the entire country. And you know who is the most solid, trusted institution in El Salvador? Paradoxically, the armed forces. What a contrast for a country who spent 12 years in a civil war that cost 100, 125,000 lost lives between the now president-elect, a former guerrilla member, Sanchez Seren, and the armed forces backed by the United States. So there is a demonic contradiction, to say the least, in what has happened in El Salvador in the last 25 years. Of course, we need to revise the inter-American system institutions and instruments, as was brilliantly uh, I would say referred to by, by Kevin. It's not possible to have an AES who also believe in half pregnant women. System or a inter-American democratic charter. As a matter of fact, as it is right now, we can close the OAS now and nothing will happen tomorrow. I wouldn't be able to pay the bills, but, <laughs> yeah. but that's a different Nothing, <laughs> nothing. You know, one of the advantages of not employee. being an ambassador is that now I don't have to abo yeah, <laughs> abide by <laughs> any government. <laughs> so I can speak myself, finally. So thank you very much. <laughs> but that's, I think that that's another matter. Uh, but, but, but we need to revise not only the instruments, we need to revise whether really the inter-American system is up to the challenge of democracy in Latin America. And in this case, in the Caribbean too. And then we can concentrate in more, I would say, day-to-day -day challenge that affect those who walk in the streets in Latin America. Not the politicians, not the powerful classes, not the intellectuals, no people who walk in the streets every day. And what are the, 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 their problems? They want solutions to what is really important for them. Eliminate crime and violence, reduce poverty and equal inequality, promote jobs creation, concentrate budgets in social investment, housing, education, food, health, because for them, democracy is irrelevant. Democracy has not changed or has not contributed at all to solve the day-to-day -day problems of people. So I would like to close by saying that perhaps the biggest challenge is to avoid the death of democracy in Latin America, but a more immediate challenge is that democracy stop being irrelevant to Latin Americans. So thank you very much. Very good, Rene. Um, next in our program, uh, we'll have a presentation by Dr. Hector Shamis from Georgetown University. And uh, this is his debut at Hudson today. So, Hector. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, thank you for the invitation, being here. And uh, to my colleagues, uh, the panel. I don't know, here I'm faced with the problem of being the last one when 
uh, everything intelligent has been said. Uh, duplication will happen, and uh, and the audience is going to get bored. Uh, so trying to somehow make sense of uh, this uh, situation, uh, I'm going to address some of the things brought up by Kevin and René, and, and put it in the context of uh, a few things that I have to say. Uh, I'm, I'm happy I'm on record uh, and on paper <laughs> for saying that what has been going on in Latin America uh, is plain, simple authoritarianism. And we'll talk a little bit about the, the notion of competitive dictatorships or something like that. Uh, but uh, let me start with the, with the Venezuelan issue. I mean, whoever has, uh, whoever has stopped, uh, whoever has spent uh, a day in a Latin American politics class, Latin American history class, uh, democratization class, transitions, uh, and so on and so forth, it knows very well that when the transitions enterprise started, the intellectual enterprise started uh, in the early to mid-80s, and, and, and the first important contribution, the famous uh, O'Donnell Schmitter uh, Transitions Volumes came out in 1986, 86 exactly. There was a critical case of stable, robust, uh, and healthy, consolidated, was a word used, a democratic system in Latin America. And that was, if, if I can get the, the water, no, the water, I'm sorry. Oh, the water. Sorry. Fortunately, enough is not sponsored yes. by Alba Petroleos. <laughs> it will be soon. <laughs> uh, and that was Venezuela. And we studied uh, how all those unstable, brutal, violent countries in the rest of Latin America, uh, how were they going to become democratic? And, and, and a good chunk of that literature was based on imitating what uh, the Venezuelans have done pacting their differences, uh, splitting them, negotiating them, and creating a framework for political elites to accommodate and compromise. Valuable, but as we know with the hindsight of the history now, not enough. And this is important today because uh, I do think that uh, the Venezuelan crisis is a watershed uh, and will be uh, dramatically important, will be what in political science we call, forgive me, a, a a, a path-dependent uh, event, uh, path-dependent in the sense that what happens with Venezuela, whether it is resolved or non-resolved, or how it is resolved, this crisis will have tremendous consequences for the rest of Latin America, particularly for democratic systems. In any case, uh, as I said, I've been on, I am on paper saying that uh, uh, the, much of what has been going on in Latin America is authoritarianism because uh, there is a fundamental democratic uh, component that uh, has been systematically violated in Latin America. And that's this, if I were to put my finger into one and only one of the multiple challenges of democracy in the region, I would say that the single most important challenge is perpetuation in office. Uh, it's, a, it's a regional disease. It's a virus uh, of uh, a huge proportion that uh, travels in Latin America uh, knows no borders, knows no parties, uh, seems to be uh, uh, also a, a tremendous, uh, if, you th if you want, a, a betrayal of the democratization movement of the 1980s, all those hopes and that throughout Latin America people had on, uh, on human rights and on, on, on democracy. Uh, in Venezuela, everybody knows there is no such a thing as term limits. Um, uh, and the, the same political party has been in office for 15 years. Uh, in Bolivia, uh, there, there was a constitutional change. The, the, the tool, it has to be said, is uh, oftentimes used for perpetuation in office has been a process of constitutional change in which the incumbent president uh, is the direct beneficiary of. Uh, in Bolivia, that has happened with a new constitution that allowed for a second term re-election. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, Bolivia wasn't mentioned today, the, the new constitution said that the, the, the sitting president Evo Morales first term counted. Uh, so he wouldn't be entitled to two consecutive terms, only one, because there was his second consecutive term. But there was a ruling 
by the Constitutional Tribunal that said that, and listen to this, that Kevin knows that very well, yeah, obviously. Very, very well. Yeah, that actually the Bolivian state has a new name. It's a different state. It's the plurinational Bolivian state, uh, and therefore uh, the new constitution rules and governs a different country. And that Evo Morales was president in a previous non-existing country, the Bolivian state. But the plurinational state is a, is a new, it's funny, but it's not. Uh, in Ecuador, Rafael Correa is going forward full speed for indefinite re-election, though he has lost uh, in the most important cities, and don't discount that. In Nicaragua, Daniel Ortega is doing the same, except that he's already under violating the Constitution by virtue of a Supreme Court decree that allowed him, the, 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 Constitution, the Constitution in Nicaragua doesn't allow for immediate re-election. Uh, Ortega uh, was a candidate and a winner, and the Supreme Court ruled that it was legal. Uh, in Argentina, uh, people don't remember, but Menem in the 90s, and that's why I'm saying, you know, well, the, the, this is the left. Well, the right has done it too, if Menem is right, which is, you know, we can debate it as well if you want. Uh, but Fernando Enrique Cardoso did in Brazil, a, a true champion of democracy, uh, to stay in office. He didn't stay forever, but he stayed a second consecutive term by reframing, by redrafting the Constitution. In Argentina, uh, Nestor Kirchner stayed in office one term, uh, he, his wife stayed for a second term, but uh, the initial plan of, uh, as, a, as a student of mine from El Salvador called it Primer Damismo, uh, <laughs> the, the original plan of Primer Damismo didn't work because he died while she was in her first term, though, so she had to run for the second term. And, uh, Strongly enough, for quite some time, there was important talk of uh, eternal Cristina. Cristina Eterna was the, the wording that uh, people used to uh, use his, you know, supporters, her supporters, of course. This is dramatic. This violates the one of the fundamental principles of democracy. It violates its spirit, uh, which is alternation in power. And people would say, well, uh, parliamentary regimes don't have alternation in power, so why not presidential regimes? And the, the trick is that, well, parliamentary regimes can, and a government in a parliamentary system can end any day. Uh, but presidentialism has fixed term limits, therefore alternation in power in some way uh, is essential. Uh, in addition to the fact that in a presidential system, the chief of the executive is the chief of government, so it has legislative powers. Uh, that in a parliamentary system, the one using the, ex the executive does not help. And I'm using and saying all this uh, simply to highlight that these tricks of perpetuation via constitutional reform uh, lead to two fundamental viola violations of a democratic system. One is executive discretion, precisely, in a presidential system. And again, uh, it's not done only by uh, uh, current left-wing governments. Uh, in Venezuela, uh, the enabling laws are legion, and you know, that's how the executive legislate. In Ecuador, the urgent bills allow the uh, executive to legislate. In uh, Colombia, the extraordinary powers are the way uh, used by the executive to legislate, and by the way, uh, President Uribe did use and abuse his uh, extraordinary powers, and by the way, he also changed the constitution to stay a second consecutive term and wanted to stay a third consecutive term, except the tribu Constitutional Tribunal uh, ruled that unconstitutional and stop uh, the idea right there. Uh, uh, so uh, in Argentina, uh, the people talk about the superpowers, superpoderes, that the Constitution reserves for uh, times of economic emergency uh, it only only in those under those conditions is the president allowed to legislate. Uh, interestingly enough, that was used uh, at the time of hyperinflation, and that was used at the time of uh, deep banking crisis. But that continues to be used by the current government. Uh, the the anecdotal, yeah, you're going to laugh, but it's not funny. Uh, but you're allowed to laugh. Is that in the same uh, speech in Congress, the equivalent to the State of the Union that the president delivers, she boasts about Asian-type rates of growth, uh, and she also requires requests the renewal of superpowers for the executive to legislate. Uh, and, and she gets away with it. Uh, 
So this executive discretion has uh, altered dramatically uh, issues of separation of power uh, to the extent that the executive uh, legislates by decree. And there is a second order alteration of uh, separation of powers and checks and balances, the judiciary. Uh, it hasn't been named by my colleagues before, uh, but it's the other uh, big problem of Latin American democracy. Uh, in Venezuela is the paradigmatic case, uh, Supreme Court, the Supreme Court has been packed, but it's not only in Venezuela, it has been packed in Ecuador under Lucio Gutierrez, it has been packed uh, in Bolivia through the uh, enlargement with the new uh, judges. Uh, in Ecuador, it has been packed by the separation of the Supreme Court with the constitutional, and the Constitutional Tribunal, and the Constitutional Tribunal uh, has allowed the president to get away with legislation of dubious constitutional nature, uh, including the, the recent uh, Ley Loca, the crazy law that uh, allows the executive branch to, to regulate content of uh, information and, uh, and media uh, propagation. Uh, the, the two things, the uh, lack of judicial independence, and the concentration of power uh, in the executive, together with the process of constitutional reform tailored for the incumbent president, uh, is what I base my argument on uh, authoritarianism in Latin America on. Uh, and there's a third you know, issue that I'd like to address, hasn't been addressed, luckily, uh, which is the mutilation of press freedom. Uh, if, if Latin America is in trouble in terms of its constitutional uh, procedures, in terms of separation of powers and checks and balances and alternation in power, the situation is all the more critical. The situation is tragic when it comes to press freedom. Uh, in Mexico and Brazil, uh, press organizations are regularly targeted by uh, drug dealers. Uh, and in Mexico, the situation is dismal uh, in terms of the assassination of journalists and, and, and this, including uh, the high rates all uh, NGOs have reported uh, the, the, the tragedy of uh, violence against journalists when the journalist is a, is a woman and the, and the particularly uh, cruel nature of that violence. Uh, journalists are uh, regularly targeted uh, in Mexico, uh, particularly those investigating uh, links between political power and corrupt uh, cartels, corrupt drug cartels. Uh, this speaks to issues that have been brought, which is the, the state problem in Latin America, particularly at the subnational level, the state, uh, which is unseen in most of Latin America outside of big capitals. Uh, and the local authorities uh, are typically in collusion or captured by uh, illegal criminal international organizations. In Honduras, it was mentioned, number one country in the rate of uh, journalists per capita assassinated. Uh, in Ecuador, uh, the so-called Ley Loca controls uh, media excesses, uh, has created a figure of media lynching, uh, and it has already held, it has already held a, a, a journalist uh, cartoonist Bonil accountable to that, forcing him, Bonil was in Washington just a month or two ago, uh, forcing him to redraw his cartoon uh, or uh, go to jail. Uh, in Argentina, the government uh, mounted a political campaign for about five years against one media conglomerate uh, on the pretext of uh, concentration and monopolization of information, which is a problem, but simply to make a deal to be in collusion with another uh, supportive media conglomerate to which some of these uh, licenses and frequencies are, have been already being transferred. Uh, in Venezuela, of course, uh, everybody knows NTN24, for example, Colombian news channel, banned and censored, uh, continues to do report uh, using webcasts. Uh, apropos the competitive nature of uh, 
electoral process in Venezuela, media access in the last election was 25 to 1 in favor of Maduro against Enrique Capriles. Uh, and, uh, and that with respect to uh, this issue. A, uh, another issue that was touched upon and having Kevin here is, uh, is interesting and is, is timely. I think the OAS could do better. The OAS should do better, much better. The OAS um, should nothing else than the, should do nothing else than look back at its own history, and and, and look at the Inter-American Commission uh, in the 70s, the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights in the 70s, uh, when regardless of who was in power, sent missions to document torture, assassination, and to interview the victims of that. Uh, at the time, the Secretary General was Alejandro Fila, an Argentine. Uh, Ambassador Darren Bloom probably knows him very well. And, uh, and he did exactly that. Uh, so there is no reason why the OAS cannot mediate in the Venezuelan conflict. That's the very logic of human rights. That's the very logic of uh, preventive diplomacy, and that's in the manual. Uh, the OAS should do better, and, 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 uh, and we all hope for that. Uh, finally, to conclude, a uh, couple of reflections on a few things that have been said. Uh, number one, political parties that Kevin brought up and René continued. True, political parties are in deep trouble in Latin America and elsewhere. Don't forget that. Uh, in the U.S., they're in deep trouble. You run that poll in the U.S., it's exactly the same. You do it in Europe, and it is the same. Uh, there are many explanations for that. Uh, Number one, history. Parties are old institutions. Most parties have 100. Good, paradoxically, good, stable democracies have quite institutionalized party systems. Institutionalized party systems mean parties are old. Old parties uh, were created to represent a society that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, societies that uh, all traditional parties are social movements. And look at European party systems. Uh, the Christian Democrats, or the Socialists, or the Conservatives, they represent certain social constituencies. Societies have become so increasingly heterogeneous, complex, and diverse that those parties cannot represent them anymore. They have a problem with their manual of instructions. Uh, something of that nature has been going on in Latin America as well. Uh, the large middle class, uh, the information society, the heterogeneity and diversity of uh, its economically active population. Uh, and that is, you know, certainly a problem for political parties. Uh, another important element here is uh, demography. Uh, Latin America is uh, also a young population, uh, and the youth votes less in Latin America, as well as in Europe, as well as in the U.S. Uh, and therefore, voting less, uh, having a different set of agendas and values, no wonder they don't feel represented by political parties that are 100 years old. Uh, if that democracy is lucky, because that will make, a, make that democracy stable. And here is a paradox, is a, is a, is a true uh, chicken-egg problem and is a, is a true vicious circle of uh, democratic stability. Uh, I think regarding political parties, uh, we should also learn a little bit from Egypt. Uh, they're in trouble, they don't represent, uh, but they're irreplaceable. Uh, Egypt or the Arab Spring. Because none, none of these groups, uh, vibrant and democratic and vocal and organized, uh, no uh, social media can aggregate uh, interests and identities in a social optimum the way uh, political parties do. They're all particularistic. They're all oriented towards their own narrow, narrowly defined identity and, and values. And they cannot play the game of democracy. And we still need uh, those parties, uh, but we need to make them work. Uh, the Europeans are facing the exact same problem, by the way. You look at the elections in European, in local, I mean, national and European Union elections, and that's what you see. Uh, to be young in the world today is very complicated, uh, and it's not just in, uh, with the Madrid indignados, it's also with the Brazilian indignados. Uh, the young are less employed, uh, they earn less, they vote less, uh, and yet they're more educated, uh, which is a good thing, but it's a problematic thing for the stability of democracy because they're more informed and they have much higher expectations. And again, it's not only in Latin America. Finally, two things to 
to conclude uh, on on the words that we use in political science. Uh, political scientists like to be uh, complicated and come up with their uh, <coughs> funny concepts uh, that we've been using on and on and on to 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 grasp this uh, ongoing issue of uh, ongoing problems of democracy in Latin America. One, everybody will know, illiberal democracy. Uh, it's an oxymoron. Uh, there is no <laughs> democracy if there is no strong, robust constitutionalism in town. Uh, there is no democracy. There is no meaning for democracy if you can be picked up at 3 a.m. just because there is an executive order, <laughs> period. <laughs> that is not democracy, neither here nor anywhere. Uh, and that is what a quote-unquote illiberal democracy uh, would be. Uh, I wouldn't call that democracy. That was Argentina uh, under the military. You could be exactly that, picked up at 3 a.m. Uh, and thrown out in a, an unknown place, precisely because there was no constitution, uh, uh, no enforceable constitution, no constitution being enforced. The other one is competitive authoritarianism, competitive uh, dictatorship, you know, uh, several of my colleagues, Steve Levitsky, Andreas Schedler, and many others have come up with that. And it's oxymoronic as well, because uh, an election to be competitive has to be free and fair. Uh, and if the access to media uh, on the process leading to an election is 25 to 1 uh, bias in favor of one candidate, that election is by definition neither free nor fair. And therefore, it cannot be competitive. Uh, and so uh, we are sort of... Uh, playing this, you know, we're like dogs trying to bite uh, our tails. When what we have is something older and simple that everybody understands. What we have is plain and simple authoritarianism, as was coined by a Spanish political scientist way back in the 60s, Juan Lintz, who said there's nothing unusual, nothing extraordinary about authoritarian regimes coming to office through elections, uh, which are neither competitive nor free and fair. But there is plenty, and there was already in the 60s, uh, and plenty in history of authoritarian regimes elected, uh, from Stresner in Latin America, from the PRI in Mexico, to Salazar in Portugal, to Suharto in Indonesia, who had uh, Suharto ruled for 20 years with three parties to make it appear competitive, precisely. The three parties were his. So, on that note, this is important, I think, because when we use these words, uh, what we're doing is we're giving them a pass. Uh, when we're saying, well, competitive, uh, this is what Maduro says, I'm a legitimate government. Well, democracy is a method to come into office and it's a method, a, a, a method to gain in power and it's also a method regarding how to exercise that power. It, it has happened so many times. Maduro get a pass if we call him competitive dictatorship. He gets a pass because the word competitive there points in the direction of some degree of legitimacy. And therefore, we have to do something about the fact that he's a legitimate government. And unfortunately, once again, there is plenty of historical evidence of elected governments that are the champions of human rights violations. The same, by the same token, illiberal democracy, a democracy where a constitutional mechanism doesn't work fully, is not worth calling itself democracy. And there, and there we're giving them a pass. I don't think we can give a pass to any of them anymore. The future of democracy in Latin America is very risky today. It's very complicated. And, uh, and, 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 I, and again, I conclude with this reflection on the future of democracy on the basis of what happens in Venezuela, because it will have effects. And not only because of fiscal resources. Venezuela is broke anyway today. There is no more Alba. There is no more Petro Caribe anyway. But what there is is a lesson that what it means to be left and what it means to be progressive in Latin America. Because if this is what means to be left, then we're doomed, we will be doomed by the fact that we've had, a, and, and presumably this is the left, we've had therefore an authoritarian left. And that is not good for democracy because the backlash of that will be dramatic. And it will open the door for a right to come back and a right that will use that pretext to rule again in very undemocratic fashion. So on this very optimistic note, <laughs> I appreciate your time. Thank you. We have uh, a little bit of time for some questions. Um, the gentleman here on the left, 
Thanks. And tell us who you are. Well, my name is Emmanuel Devalillo. I am a Venezuelan who is uh, in one month going to be back into his hunt country. i um, actually very frightened to see what I'm going to find because I left nine months ago and I'm not sure what I'm going to find when I get back. Um, but I just wanted to point out a few things. Um, first of all, I, I mean, excellent presentations from all of you as expected. Um, but in my humble opinion, I think there are severe methodological problems when you try to refer to Latin America as a region. Latin America is a subset of sub-regions with very different realities, and it is really difficult to uh, get Venezuela and Chile and Brazil in the same bag when we all know how very different their own realities are. So in terms of a very informed discussion, as I'm pretty sure this will be and continue to be, um, we have to understand that there is no way that we can compare them um, or get them to be measured under the same terms because it's not going to get us anywhere. That would be actually replicating the mistakes that the United States has committed ever since um, the whole region began to um, transit towards democracy. Um, we cannot uh, overlook the fact that the U.S. foreign policy in the past few years has been inconsistent and ineffectual, and largely that has led to the um, rampant growth in this sort of um, you know, petty dictators that have arisen under the not watchful eyes of the United States. Um, so again, challenges and opportunities are very different for each of these sub-regions, and that's not the same to speak about the Southern Corn or the Central American region. Um, for some, the Democratic Charter is dead, even, because there is no point in discussing it further when you understand that the type of democracy that is um, upheld in the spirit of the Charter is a representative type of democracy that has a very, very specific set of conditions that need to be met in order to be considered as such. Right. So if we go back to the charter and you see it's letra muerta, it's that letter, you don't really see it reflected anywhere. My question is, I'm going to apologize for the extension of it, um, so can the OAS save itself? Because we understand that uh, a new document must arise, maybe a protocol, who knows, but um, is the OAS prepared to face the systematic attacks that these countries have made against the inter-American system? Venezuela withdrew from the Court of Inter-American Human Rights. Nobody said anything. And thus, you know, those elections that were in 2013 were contested and the results were impunct and the Supreme Court shut it down and nobody said anything. But the OAS still recognizes gov the Venezuelan government as a democratically elect government. So this is actually policy that is at play here and we need to understand that is the OAS prepared or not to face the challenges that it has brought on itself. Thank you. Well, I'll try to be very, very, very succinct. Um, it, indeed, I mean, I, I share your, your anxiety about using Latin America as a unit of analysis. I mean, Latin America is a big place, right? <laughs> uh, and yet, I would still uh, want us not to lose sight of the fact that whatever problems we have now, um, those cases which raise eyebrows, uh, which, you know, those cases which are accused of being examples of authoritarian regimes are very much the exception, not the rule. Um, and not just that. Uh, well, I mean, in, in saying that, I'm also saying that, quite frankly, you know, when I, when I take a look, when I take a glance at the political landscape in Latin America, in the vast majority of countries, I see no eagerness whatsoever to replicate what Venezuela is going through. Um, I don't see that eagerness in Brazil, I don't see that eagerness even in Argentina, I don't see that eagerness in my country that has just elected a center-left kind of, of, of government. Uh, so we have, to be, we have to be careful with our inferences. I mean, uh, there might be 
um, examples which are problematic in a number of ways, but the replicability of those examples are, I, I very much, uh, I would caution against the easy assumption that, that this, you know, might spread like a, like a cancer. And, and this leads me to, a, to another reflection, which is that, uh, you know, we've been, as, as your friend, um, the senator, I guess, alluded to, we've been in this discussion for 25 years. Well, I mean, the process of constructing democratic cultures in Latin America was never bound to be a straight line. And uh, I would very much suggest that we take the long view. Um, there was always bound, I mean, there was always the, the chance of this, uh, this process encountering setbacks. There was always the chance of the process having ups and downs. And guys, don't forget that it took 200 years almost to the U.S. to give full rights to the black population. Don't forget that it took Europe 800 years to have a parliament that was fully elected on universal suffrage. So these are long processes. And that's one of the reasons that led me to focus in my presentation on some trends. I mean, perhaps there are other trends that are worth mentioning. I'm, I'm pretty sure there are. But some trends that go beyond the, the, the headlines. Because uh, my impression is that beyond the headlines is where you found, where you find, where you're likely to find the things that will truly define the future of democracy in, in Latin America. Now, the second point, very briefly, can the OAS save itself? I mean, that's a very complicated question, but I'll give you, I'll give you my impression in a, in a, in a nutshell. Um, I'll be very candid here. Given the current political climate in the region and the very visible, quite frankly, uh, a reluctance of most countries to, uh, to talk about these um, issues related to democracy, a reluctance that is uh, played out day in and day out and has been playing out for a decade and a half at the very least at the OAS uh, um, in a very visible way. I have very serious doubts about the effectiveness of collective mechanisms to protect democracy, what I alluded to in my, in my presentation. I think we can do very valuable work, and we do every day, very valuable work in terms of democracy promotion, but the protection of democracy is a different story. And I don't think this is, a, uh, this is an issue that is unique to the OAS. This is happening everywhere. And this is happening precisely because the notion that governments uh, should be elected in elections has become, has become the norm. And that claim to democratic legitimacy that stems from being elected uh, makes it very difficult to activate democracy promotion, uh, democracy, uh, the, the mechanisms to, to, to protect democracy. So um, I cannot give you a straight answer to that one. All I can say is that as of today, I see much more future, and I see a bright future actually in what the OAS does in terms of democracy promotion than in what it can do in terms of the protection of democracy. Hi, my name is Karna Bodman, and um, some time ago I served on the National Security Council staff in the White House. I know you all have been focusing on the long term, but I do have a short term question, if you don't mind, regarding Brazil. And that is that uh, we've all heard a lot of stories about the corruption, crime, drug dealers, and so forth in Brazil, and yet very soon the world will be focused, well, television cameras will be focused on Brazil for the two 2016 Olympics. How do you see that country handling it, and how do you think their image will survive? during that event? 
Well, we were just discussing um, this uh, before coming into the podium, and uh, we were discussing that the World Cup, for instance, will to talk about the the, the short run. It's a um, classical uh, situation juncture in Latin America where government used that month to do difficult things, and uh, most of most of the time they get away with crime because people are so concentrated in other things that uh, they don't care whatever else is happening in the world at that moment, except for Brazil. Because I think, and I think that uh, we, we, we were commenting this, that the country who could not get away with crime in that juncture will be Brazil. And the fact that in Brazil, people feel that democracy is not relevant to whatever they want to achieve, to their aspirations, will, reflect, will be reflected uh, during the World Cup in, what, 45 days. And uh, it, it will occur because there is a disconnection, actually, with, between Brazilians' aspirations and, 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 uh, and the political class and, and democracy. Same happened in Panama three days ago. Varela was in third place. I don't think that anyone uh, could have bet if it would have been the Kentucky Derby on Varela uh, last uh, Sunday. And the fact that the government of Panama spent all these billions of dollars uh, building the canal or actually uh, remodeling the canal, the fact that the um, Government of Panama, for instance, is spent all these billions of dollars in resources to get care of the macro infrastructure of the country without paying attention to what's happening. The people will be reflected in Brazil very soon. Because people see stadiums, people see infrastructure, people see a lot of uh, uh, budgeting resources being spent uh, to host this uh, world-class event and they have problems uh, having enough income to take the bus or to get food on their table. So I think that it will be reflected very soon that disconnection, that dysfunctionality in Brazil. Unfortunately, I think, because I want to see the Brazilians dancing samba rather than protesting on the streets in 45 time days. No, I wouldn't want them to see dancing samba uh, at the World Cup. That, that would mean that uh, we... <laughs> We, we won't be there, you know. You won't be there anyway. Uh, winning it all. <laughs> but we'll see. Uh, John Kerry uh, asked Messi to play for the U.S. yesterday. I want to remind everybody. And uh, in his dreams, of course. No, I think that... Uh, I think that... Uh, I agree on, on the Brazil issue. Uh, I think that... What happened last summer at the Confederations Cup was a, a rehearsal of what may happen uh, next month. Uh, and I think the Brazilian government knows that very well. And, and it speaks to the issues of uh, youth and parties and, and the political system, whether they feel or they don't feel represented, and they don't, clearly. Uh, one, one thing that I, will, I, will, I would like to add on this issue of parties is that the lesson of the Arab Spring, Arab Spring the failure of uh, the disappointment of that promise is if you look around, is the absence of parties. Uh, all the energy of civil society in Cairo couldn't translate into a democratic political party, and the only party that could run an election and have representation in the entire territory was not democratic itself. Uh, and, and we know the end of the story. And the rest for the rest of the countries, the, the same for the rest of the countries in, in the region in terms of the failure the truncated nature of this uh, movement that uh, created incredible hope about democratization in that part of the world, and it didn't. That's why, you know, we still need the parties. We can uh, do, a, do without them. Uh, regarding the OAS, um, I think it's not a question of uh, either or. Yeah, democracy promotion uh, is easier than uh, <laughs> democracy enforcement, let's put it that way, than, than res resolving democratic crisis. But I think, I think there are mechanisms of you know, it's not a question of whether Maduro has to stay or, or Maduro has to leave, for example. I think it would have been an easier question to say to hold Maduro accountable to his international commitments. 
which is a respect of human rights, which go, which is the nature of, of human rights uh, as a principle and as a system. Maduro, you stay, you are the legitimate president, but respect the international commitments the Venezuelan state is, is obligated to. Instead of uh, putting it in, in this either or, uh, there would have been, and also having a, 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 a less uh, a cumbersome session. I mean, I, I, think it's, I think the OAS suffer, and I think the, the human rights movement suffer from the, the, the flop of the, of the hearings, right? The, the Maria Corina Machado's uh, tes testimony that never happened, and, and so on and so forth. When step by step the Maduro regime is proving to be an authoritarian system, uh, you know, yesterday they vacated, vacated all the student camps in front of the UN and uh, by, by brutal force, moreover. Uh, and again, there are two sides. I agree that there are two sides, but the distinction is that one side is groups of civil society with stones, perhaps, with a Molotov cocktails. I give that to you. The other side is the state with access to the coercive apparatus is incomparable. The logic of two sides doesn't apply to human rights. Uh, and we've missed that, uh, that ball. The, the, we, we, we don't have our eye, eye on the ball, as they say, on that issue. Thank you. I have something to say about the OAS. Can I, Jaime? Sure. Uh, very quickly, <laughs> uh, I think that the biggest lesson that I learned over the OAS was given to me by the uh, former Salvadorian ambassador to the OAS. Margarita Escobar, who also happened to be Salvadorian ambassador to Venezuela. And uh, she told me, because we were discussing exactly your question with her, and she told me, Renee, don't get lost. The OAS is what their state members want her to be. It's not what the general secretary wants. It's not what the ambassador wants. It's not what, it's what the state members wanted her to be. And I think that what is important regarding that is that the OAS through Venezuela is paralyzed. It's paralyzed and the member states are getting Venezuela to get away with what they want by consensus, by the way. Not by imposition, by consensus. And the way in which Venezuela has bought a lot of willingness is through Petrocaribe. Whether it's causing a big hole in Venezuela and whether it will make the Venezuela economies implode, among other things, there are 18 boats in the Caribbean, if I'm not mistaken, that belong to Venezuela, or 14 boats mm -hmm. that belong to Venezuela. So while that reality exists in other countries who are dictatorships, according to, 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 to the concept by, by Hector that I agree with, that means that the OAS should be a, a club right now of approximately five members, six members, <laughs> then I think that that explains the self, I would say, correction path that the Venezuela, that, that the OAS could, could follow, which is none because the state members have decided that they were not on the issues that we have discussed here that are relevant to democracy in Latin America. One, one word. Uh, the manager of shareholders argument uh, is Carlos Lleras uh, phrase, you know, this, the way yes is what the state members want it to be. It, it applies to all international organizations, of course. But it's a half-truth. State members in the 70s uh, were Pinochet and Videla. And, uh, and the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights was active, dynamic, uh, committed to its, its mission. And, uh, and it sent that you know, famous, famous and glorious mission to Argentina under Videla uh, to document human rights violations. If, if it could be done uh, back then, under those circumstances, it could be done now as well. Can I? Can I respond? Yes. <laughs> we need to I mean, one about it's, the audience. It's, it's, it's more complicated than people <laughs> make it out to be. I mean, under the Democratic Charter, for starters, uh, the country that 
will receive a mission uh, sent by the OAS has to agree. Yeah. So, you know, in all likelihood, I mean, we can argue that that might be interesting to, to watch, but they can turn back the members of the mission the moment they arrive in the airport. I mean, it, we might think that that's a wonderful thing to watch, but I don't think it's very, it's very effective. I mean, you know, when people ask, you know, why is the OAS not mediating in, in, in Venezuela? Well, because so far as I know, we haven't received any requests to be there. And to give you an example, you know, a very concrete example of how difficult and how um, narrow the margin of maneuver is for, for, for the OAS as an institution uh, with regards to these things. I mean, let us agree, I, I, want, uh, I want a state an opinion on this. I have my own opinion, but let, you know, for the sake of the argument, I want to state an opinion. Uh, uh, you know, over the past 15 years, a lot has happened in Venezuela. Let's put it that way, okay? Some people think it's good, some people think it's bad. I have my own opinion. A lot has happened in Venezuela. Well, for the past 15 years, any country at the OAS, any of the 34 member states could have brought the issue of Venezuela to the Permanent Council. How many countries did that over the past 15 years until one month ago that Panama did? Zero is the answer. For 15 years, every single country at the OAS had the opportunity, had the prerogative to bring the matter to the Permanent Council. None did. That gives you an idea of how difficult the climate is at the OAS to discuss these things, let alone to do what needs to be done, which, let me be clear, I agree, what needs to be done to protect democracy. So a little bit of awareness about the limits of action, uh, uh, the limits of action that you experience when you're at the OAS, uh, a, I think is called for. I'm very sorry, but uh, the time has come to say good afternoon and thank you very much. Let's give our panel a round of applause for our next chapter.